Well, welcome back, guys. Hope you had a good lunch, not too heavy. Don't want you falling asleep in this afternoon session. Um, I want to draw your attention to the, the book that uh, I've brought along, not that Dai's book isn't a good one because I endorsed that one. Um, but this, in specific relation to these talks, 50 Crucial Questions. This is an overview of, of central concerns about manhood and womanhood by John Piper and Wayne Grudem. Uh, they wrote the big brown book, which is uh, probably, I would say, still the go-to work as a scholarly uh, accumulation of works on manhood and womanhood. And these are just 50 crucial questions. So some of the stuff even that you're bringing up and as this theology is sinking in, okay, yes, then what does that look like and what objections people might have, they begin to kind of deal with. So that's from actually the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. They sent those specifically along for you guys. So take, a, take a, a free copy of that. So third in the, in the four sessions, uh, the first session, a call to biblical manhood, exhortation as it were, uh, these five imperatives from 1 Corinthians 16 in, in a gospel context. Um, then we went back to basics, back to basics, you know, seeing foundations in Genesis 1 to 3 unpack the, the, the cultural uh, context, you know, it's, an, it's a global issue, it's a personal issue, um, it, is, it is something that's on people's tongues. Okay, why? What's at stake? Some reasons then why this is a, a, a really big issue, what's at stake? And then we went back to those basics and those seven evidences from Genesis 1 through 3 of male headship as God's divine design before the fall. And this is all linked up in what ultimately at stake, the glory of God in revealing his character through manhood and womanhood. Men and women created to reveal something about God in their masculinity and in their femininity. So what I want to do now is bring these things together and say that the gospel of God is the ultimate display of the glory of God. The gospel of God is the high point of the glory of God. And then marriage between a man and a woman is an earthly picture of this truth. The gospel of God is the high point of the glory of God and marriage between a man and a woman is the earthly picture of this truth. So marriage, the gospel and the glory of God of God, bringing them all together. I want to show you from the scriptures the connection between these three. So let's just start in, in Ephesians 1. And this is a quite a, a, a big text, but if you want to just drop down, drop down into verse 5 there, just in love. In love, it's not got the verses up there, but in love, it's a fourth, fourth, fourth line down. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So, the gospel. The gospel is the good news of God's plan to Choose people to be predestined as children and heirs through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. And the purpose, you see in the text, the purpose to the praise of his glorious grace, or in some translations it reads, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So you see it there in, in verse 6. The high point then of the glory of God where he images forth his grace is in the gospel. There's no greater display of the glory of God than in the gospel. And that's why the universe exists, to display God's glory and specifically in the grace of Jesus Christ because God loves his son. And in creating a universe, he, he conceived of a universe where he could best put on display the glory of his son, specifically the glory of his grace in dying for sinners. So everything exists for this purpose. We've got to get to, to ultimate purposes of things. Everything exists for this, especially man created male and female. To put it another way, the gospel is the 
ultimate display of the glory of God and we are swept up into it. But what's the link between the gospel and marriage? Well, it's found in in the passage which talks most clearly about marriage, perhaps in the New Testament, and that is in Ephesians 5. That is to say that marriage is a picture of the gospel. Ephesians 5, verse 31. In Ephesians, Paul has been talking about husbands and wives and how they're to relate to each other. He then says, in verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So he's citing here Genesis 2.24 and God's pre-fall institution of marriage between man and woman. Note that, pre-fall. He says, this is a mystery that refers to Christ and the church. Well, what's a mystery? Well, a a mystery is something that was hidden to a certain extent in the past and is now being made clear. Paul's now bringing it into focus. Paul is saying that this holding fast, this, this, this one flesh union in marriage is and always was a picture of the covenant love of Christ for his church. It's a picture of this divine drama of the gospel. And that's the link then between the gospel and marriage. So as John Piper puts it in his book, This Momentary Marriage, he says this, Christ obtained the church by his blood and formed a new covenant with her, an unbreakable marriage. The ultimate thing we can say about marriage is that it exists for God's glory. That is, it exists to display God. Now we see how. Marriage is patterned after Christ's covenant relationship to his redeemed people, the church. And therefore, the the highest meaning and the most ultimate purpose of marriage is to put that covenant relationship of Christ and his church on display. That's why marriage exists. Staying married, therefore, is not mainly about staying in love. It's about keeping covenant. There's a statement. It's not mainly about staying in love. It's about keeping covenant. Christ will never leave his wife, ever. There may be times of painful distance and tragic backsliding on our part, but Christ keeps his covenant forever. Marriage is a display of that. It's mainly about telling the truth with our lives. It's about portraying something true about Jesus Christ and the way he relates to his people. It's about showing in real life the glory of the gospel. So to recap then, marriage is a picture of the gospel and the gospel is the high point of the display of the glory of God. Marriage, the gospel and the glory of God. There's the the link. In the book of Ephesians, because we want to take, when we're dealing with these texts, we want to take them in the context of, of the book. In the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians 1, Paul declares the gospel. In chapter 2, he explains the gospel. In chapter 3, he tells us that the church reveals the gospel. So, in other words, Christ makes those who are dead in sin and under wrath, he makes them alive by grace. He brings Jew and Gentile together and to God and he creates this new humanity in himself. And then in chapter 3, verse 10, this new humanity is revealed as the church. So when you are saved, you're not only saved individually, you are saved into the church. And the church is always displayed in these local expressions. You have the universal church and then you have local expressions of the church. And the church then is to to make known, it says in Ephesians 3, verse 10, 10, the manifold wisdom of God to the heavenly realms. God's displaying his character in Jesus in his church to supernatural powers, angels and demons. So so there is, just in there, there's a great call, a great honour in being a Christian and being part of a local church because God has great purpose in that. And, and, and the church's task is, is proclamation of the gospel. Go, go make disciples. 
Proclamation is the task, but transformation is the evidence that this gospel is true. So, so it's not just a set of propositional truths, but it's the power of God. It's the power of God for salvation. And that word salvation, as Paul uses it, is from your conversion all the way through to glorification. So just as God creates man, male and female, to image him forth, and just as the fall then mars that image, Christ then purchases the people on the cross, he renews the image of God and creates a new humanity. So Christ then redeems our masculinity. These are deep truths that we need to grasp. He redeems our masculinity. So before we ever talk about roles in marriage, headship and submission, leadership and following, before you think about dating a woman, you must make a decision not about courtship or marriage, but about Christ and Christianity, about who you are as redeemed men, and then how you live in light of that as part of a new humanity. Am I convinced that my life must abound to God's glory according to his revealed will? You've got to get first things first. Will you follow him or the world? Are you about his glory and the advancement of his kingdom? Or is it about your personal preferences and your kingdom? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whatever, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's about him, about his fame. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So his kingdom ruled across the earth through you, not needing you, but through you. Imagine Jesus' face when he was praying this prayer in Gethsemane. If there is a way, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Always the will of the Father, always the will of God, always agreeing with his word, his authority. So men, you live for something. You live for something. This gives great purpose to your lives. No matter what your day job is, you live for something. As Paul says in Romans 14, verse 7, for not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. So every fibre of your body is resurrected, as it were, from that text, to live with purpose. And so there's a word in here for every one of you today. You live for the glory of God because you got all you need in Christ. So on the basis of this transforming gospel, Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 1, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. At the beginning of Ephesians 5, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. In other words, you've been transformed by the gospel. And now you've got a family likeness that's restored to you in Christ. Now, go and act like it. Know who you represent. So then when we come to marriage in Ephesians 5, and Paul says he's talking about Christ and the church, we see that marriage has gospel meaning and gospel motivation. Gospel meaning and motivation. It's picturing the gospel, but it's motivated by the gospel because marriage between man and woman has been redeemed, as it were, in this new order. So men, if you don't get married, you already have everything you need because you've got Christ. And if you do, and it gets hard, and the beauty fades, and illness comes, or she's moody and demanding, you're not going anywhere. You can love her. You can love her unconditionally because God supplied all your needs in Christ. I want men to desire marriage. You should. But first, understand whom it's for. Marriage is God's plan created for God's glory. Understand that and desire that first. Then you're ready to talk about courtship or marriage. Because marriage is one of the great privileges and culture, culture doesn't think highly of marriage. You just need to look at the quick divorce ads on the internet. 
You want to talk about marriage. Well, the basis of marriage is this. God has called you to lay down your life for one person and then act out the gospel in your relationship. Because the gospel's at stake in marriage. Marriage, the gospel, and the glory of God. And that should make you fear. It should cause a certain trembling at the responsibility, not a paralysis that that makes you abdicate any kind of commitment, but a certain trembling, because you've got to take your role in that marriage very seriously. Once you grasp that high view of marriage, once you see your role as a man serving this higher purpose, then your desires or even... Your wife's desires, even selfish desires, are superseded by that higher purpose. So let's talk about the roles in marriage. The roles. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So you can see from the text on the screen and what I've underlined there and emboldened, to, hopefully that's clear to you, you can see that in marriage the role of wives is compared to the church and the role of husbands to Christ. A wife is to submit to her own husband, who is her head, in the same way that the church gladly and voluntarily submits to her head, Jesus Christ. So, here's a point to get from this. Just as the roles of Christ and the church are irreversible, so are the roles of husband and wife. To to get that as a takeaway from, from this. Just as the roles of Christ and the church are irreversible, which we'll all agree on, because of the parallel Paul draws here, the roles of husband and wife are irreversible too. Headship is leadership with authority. It's a functional thing, not a qualitative thing, remember? And submission is a glad affirmation and following of that God-given leadership. Again, it's functional, not qualitative. So, it's a, so what you see here in, is this headship and submission is a voluntary leader-follower relationship. So verse 23, Paul says to wives that the husband is the head. The husband is the head. So this is not for discussion. For the husband is the head of the wife. This is divine design. The role of a man is to be head of his wife. Why? Because he's male. Not because he's competent as a great leader. So men, you are the head. What kind of head are you though? Because in verse 25, the command is to love. Husband, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And that's what your headship looks like. Sacrificial, protective love. Let all that you do be done in love. Headship is sacrificial, protective love. So the next slide then begins to explain that from the text. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So men, marriage is this this calling from God to Lay down your life for one of his daughters and to serve her unconditionally, whether she deserves it or not. Remember, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. There's a cost in marriage, but it's not a lamentable sacrifice. It's glorious sacrifice. It displays Jesus' love for his bride, a laying down of the life. He won't forsake her, even when she doesn't respond to him as she ought. And this is going to happen in your marriage. Your wife won't always respond to your efforts at leadership as she ought. You must protect her physically and spiritually and always aiming for her good, for her sanctification. 
What do you do when your wife doesn't respond to you as she ought and, you, and you've made good efforts from a good heart to, to put into place what you ought to as a, as a Christ-like leader? What do you do? You, you've been given a wife who will sanctify you, but she's been given a husband who will sanctify her. You've got to remember this. You've got to remember that the purpose of your headship is to protect and promote her sanctification. So let me, let me show you a biblical example of what it looks like when, when the wife will reject the husband's approach at sacrificial, protective, loving leadership. Look at John 13. John 13, we have Jesus' own example. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it round his waist. So here you have Jesus. He, he knows his identity. He's secure in his love of his Father. And it's because of that love that he, he rises up to, to wash his disciples' feet. He's able to love his disciples, the bride, unconditionally. So this isn't stoic duty, men, as a husband. This is glad obedience to God first. If your lo loving sacrifice to your wife doesn't proceed from your security in God's love, then your leadership's going to be begrudging. It's going to be dutiful or manipulative, begrudging, dutiful, or manipulative. You'll, you'll do things for her and become bitter and blaming when she doesn't respond to you. Or you'll do it and you'll become self-righteous. Look at me, I'm just such a great sacrificial leader. Or you'll do it to get your own way. You'll look after the kids while she goes to the gym. All the time you're doing it, now she's going to let you play golf with the guys at the weekend. You're looking like you're doing that sacrificial leadership, but what's going on behind is, I want to get out with the guys and play. You know, she'll be all right. I've got money in the bank here. You're not doing it as unto the glory of God and for her sanctification. Continuing the text. So Jesus, he takes the towel, he ties it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do not wash my feet. Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you'll understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not, only, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. So Jesus, he takes the status of this servant leadership by putting that towel on. But notice this, your wife won't always respond well to your efforts to lead. Peter, no. So what does Jesus do? Does he just throw in the towel? <laughs> well, I've tried. I've tried, Peter. You know, I've tried washing your feet. I'm doing this. No. You've got to take the lead. You've got to stay down there. You've got to teach patiently with your actions and your words. That's what Jesus does. So that you win your wife with truth by love. You win her with truth by love. She's going to teach you much in your marriage, but your responsibility is, is to take the lead in this way. That's why it's a hard task. Jesus doesn't throw a tantrum. He doesn't say, I've tried, suit yourself, get on with it. He's patient. He gets down. He speaks carefully and wisely. And as I said before, when he got up, there's only one leader in that room. And that's a man. That's a husband. He loves because he's loved by God and he seeks God's will. And he does things for God's glory and the good of his bride. And when Christ dies on that cross, he secures the good of his bride forever. So your headship is a loving, sacrificial leadership that protects. And that's your role. That's your role, men. Now, headship looks a little bit different from dominance, doesn't it? Or a right to rule. It's a decision to love that's not based on emotion. It's a kind of love that's unconditional. So if you begin to initiate with that kind of love, 
a godly woman will begin to respond in marriage because she's your body. She's your own flesh. And Paul stresses that particular bond in Ephesians 5 and verse 28 as he explains that a man must also provide for his wife. So it's, it's, it's loving, sacrificial leadership that protects and provides. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his, his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. Christ and church connected, husbands and wives connected. Just as the church is the body of Christ, your wife is your body, your own flesh. She's your own wife. You are to love her, not another. She's your own wife. You're joined in a one flesh union. You are not one flesh with your children. Scriptures don't say that. And many Christian couples, many young Christian couples, baby comes into the mix, baby's central in that marriage. Baby comes an idol. Christ central, husband and wife in Christ. That's the first relationship. Children come into that. The baby does not get in between and then of course you get that problem where the baby comes in between, husbands and wives are split up, all attention on them and they forget their primary ministry unto one another. One flesh with the wife. Where the head goes, the body follows. So your head, your head in that relationship, the body follows. But it's an agreeable following. You know, the responsibility lies primarily with the head to lead the body but the head doesn't want to lead the body somewhere that's going to hurt the body because the head will be hurt too. So a wise head takes the body in a good direction. A foolish head runs straight into trouble and harms the body too. So you've got to nourish and you've got to cherish your wife. How do you, how do you cherish your, your wife? Well, it's, this, it's the idea of, of, of keeping her warm. Keeping her warm. So there's a warmth and a tenderness to your love. See, it's not a case of I'm doing well in the Lord, but my wife, she's struggling over there. You know, sitting in your study, Lord, help my wife over there. She's having a, a bad time. No, you are the help. You are the help. You're the one he's provided for her sanctification. Yes, pray that she be helped, but get up and go help her. Be the means of grace to her. You're connected to her. She's your flesh. You've got to cherish her. And a lot of guys, they get this idea and get a bit of theology and they hear a talk that stirs them on biblical headship. They go home and start bashing the wife with the theology. You know, this is the way I've got to lead. This is the way it's got to be in the, in the house. And they go, they hit their wives over a, the head with a theological four by two. You've got to take that theology, that theological four by two, you've got to put it in this wood chipper, blender, and out the other end you get a mulch called cherish. And you massage that same theology into your wife's heart. It's a tenderness with the way that you lead. A tenderness, a cherishing, a nurturing and a care. So it's, it's sacrificial leadership in terms of protection and this provision, this nurture, this, this care. A word on submission then. Wives, submit to your own husbands, verse 22, as to the Lord. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Wives must submit to their own husbands with a church-like responsiveness by honouring his Christ-like leadership. Also, she must submit to her own husband in everything. Now, this isn't a mindless servitude in everything to her husband. She doesn't follow her husband into sin. She's a member of the church, the same as him. Her ultimate submission is to Christ. But this submission, and get this point here, this submission begins as an inner attitude, not just outward agreement. Submission begins with an inner attitude, not just outward agreement. At the end of the passage, Paul describes this attitude as respect 
in verse 33. She is to respond to and affirm and encourage her husband's leadership in all aspects of life together. The church submits to Christ. Christ does not submit to the church. He loves her. He lays his life down for her. The husband does not submit to the wife, but loves her and lays her life, his life down for her. And she submits to him. So again, you have this irreversible roles. They are not arbitrary. They are not reversible. They spring forth from divine design. It's the providence and the will of God. Now, when God says to you, submit to me, you ought to submit to God. Why? God's God and God's perfect. You shouldn't have a problem with that. Think of a wife. Think of a wife called to submit to her husband in the same way as to the Lord. Not exactly, but in the same way. I'd be afraid to submit to me like that. What faith that takes from a woman of God. What faith that takes, not in me, but in God. What bravery, what courage to submit to a sinful man with such commitment. But here's the thing, men. What responsibility for you. If she takes you and submits to you as her head, then woe to you. Woe to you if you abuse that and take advantage of her or you're harsh with her or you don't live with her in an understanding way. You're the head in the relationship. And I remind you, God called Adam to account first. But to whom much is given, much is expected. So do you want that responsibility? Are you living up to that responsibility? Consider that before you take a woman. Consider that as married married men and press on to be biblical in your headship. Press on. Christ leads his bride with strength, but with love and kindness and gentleness and patience. You're called to love her. She's called to respect you, not the other way around. You notice that in the text in verse 33 there. The wife is a supposed to respect the husband, the husband to love the wife. My wife needs my love, my loving care and protection and provision. I don't need her to be doing that for me. Buy me flowers, making sure I know I'm cherished. I need her respect. But she needs my love. She needs my care, tenderness and strength. Now, of course, I need her to love me and to tell me so. Of course she needs my respect, but you've got to understand what Paul's getting at here is these must be the primacy primacy of the things that are showing forth in your masculinity. Your love, her respect. Why? Because in our fallen nature, I will be, as the husband, tempted to be harsh with my wife and unloving, and she, in her fallenness, will be tempted to disrespect my leadership. So an example would be this. I was working this out with my wife back in Canada. So this is a good example. Love and respect. I come home, okay? The house is a mess. She's left clothes all over the place. So the reason behind that, let's assume that she's just been lazy and the house is in a mess, in the clothes. What do I do? Do I take out the theological four by two? and go, here, that's going to show her some text in the scripture. No. What am I called to do? Husband, love your wives, sacrificial love. I go and I pick up the clothes. I die. I die. I sacrifice. I go pick up the clothes. She sees that kind of love, and I'm not rubbing it in her face. She sees that kind of love. That kind of love begins to melt her. That's the way I'm called to act as as the husband. That's what will win my wife. That's what gives glory to God in that particular instance. Okay? Now, bear that in mind. Same kind of situation involving clothes on the floor. I throw my clothes on the floor by the wash basket and don't pick them up. Because somehow they always get back on the shelf all clean and I don't know how that happens. But anyway, so I'll dump my clothes on the, on the floor by the wash basket. Again, laziness. Throwing it, not considering What's my wife called to do there? I don't think, as I look at the scripture, my wife's called to go around picking those up after me. I'm called to die. 
She's called to respect. So in the way that she then brings that to my attention, Gavin, you know when you do that, you know, it causes me so much more work when I'm actually picking that up and putting it, and then I've got to take it down. And, and the way that she will respectfully bring that to my attention, not to massage any male ego, but as unto the Lord, that kind of respect wins me. So I think, hey, I've got to buck my ideas up and pick my clothes up and put them into the basket. And so you see how in the same situation, same, same instance, clothes on the floor, laziness at the root of it or ill consideration, love from the man is shown in a Christ-like way, respect from the woman in a church-like responsive way is shown. And there you have a complementary marriage that gives glory to God and actually then wins the other person to act in a God-honouring way. But remember this, Satan hates marriage. Satan hates marriage. Remember Genesis 3? Remember the serpents usurping of that created order in marriage? Remember how that's then integral to the, to the fall of man and separation from God and death and destruction and this disordering of male and female relationships? And Satan still hates marriage now because he hates the gospel and the glory of God and he's going to seek to destroy marriage. So there will be strife and conflict in marriage. Culture will be against you, and you will be tempted to sin because Satan is in the business of division. That's why Paul urges us to stay strong in the Lord in Ephesians 6. So you see how we're all in Ephesians here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. He's a schemer to bring down your manhood, to ruin your marriage, knowing your weaknesses. He's a powerful enemy that can tempt you to sin and to confuse and divide a husband and wife. But he's no match for Christ because Christ takes Satan's temptations and makes them work for you. Because as men of the word and prayer, as men of integrity and truth, as men who put on that armour of God each day, we take a lead then in using these Areas of conflict as redemptive opportunities in our marriage, i.e. the example I gave you. Potential area of conflict used as a redemptive opportunity in our marriage relationship. This is war. It's war inside and it's war outside. So final thoughts then. Biblical manhood is a responsibility before God, before God, as unto God first, for loving sacrificial leadership that sees itself in terms of protection and provision for women appropriate to that relationship. You could draw it, I've drawn it before as a, a picture of a heart and then in the centre of that heart is, is leadership. Surrounding that heart is, is, is love and sacrifice and then two arrows coming out of that heart, that heart with the centrality of loving, sacrificial leadership as central, it pumps out protection and provision. It pumps it out. That's how it's seen. That's biblical manhood. And then marriage is a picture of the gospel. These are profound roles for men and women in marriage because they portray the love of Christ for his bride. And marriage is an acting out of that. And we can now, guys, we can obey Ephesians 5 because we are new men. The beautiful thing is that because of the gospel, manhood is restored and redeemed so that we can and we must, we can and we must obey Ephesians 5. Not just to do better, try and do better, but because we are this thing now. And after 25 years of marriage, I've just celebrated 25 years of marriage to Amanda, you'll still be growing in this. Why? Because we're just glimpsing. We're just glimpsing the significance of this earthly marriage. No generation is able to plumb the depths of marriage because no generation can plumb the depths of the glory of the gospel. And that's why, finally, it says in Revelation 5 that the redeemed, the, the church, is gathered around the throne of God, singing about this very thing. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every 
tribe and language and people and nation. So you've got the picture then of the church around the throne of Christ singing what? About his slainness. About the gospel. Forever we will sing of the glory of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ, covenant love for his bride. That's a high picture of marriage. That's a high picture of the gospel of God. That's a high picture of manhood and womanhood and for what it exists. So I think we've got Q&A for a few minutes. Yep. Um, let me see how best to word this. Um, we've seen a bit about different roles within uh, marriage. I guess how can we see what is cultural and what is biblical? Um, so, to give an example, I've had people who react against complementarianism they say basically what you're after is 1950s um, wife tied to wife yeah. tidy picture yeah. that's what you want mm. um, that's kind of our, where our culture was yeah. how can you kind of distinguish what's actually biblical and what is just a cultural manifestation of it by studying what is biblical and seeing it modelled see I think half the problem is we've not got good models of it as well to see so you know if you're, if you're a bank teller how do you know what the uh, false banknotes are? Because you study the, you don't spend time, much time studying all the false ones, you study the real ones so you know what it is. So this needs to be taught. It needs to be taught in the churches. So, so we talk about, oh, let's transform. The church needs to be transformed first. Let the church be holy first. That's how revival starts. When the church gets gripped by the glory of God, when the church repents and when the church becomes holy, then it has an effect into culture. So let the church become holy. Let the church get a grip of the glory of manhood and womanhood and marriage. Let the church be taught like this, yes, from the pulpit, and then I would advocate flowing out into real systematic teachings of these things in your uh, men's groups, women's groups, together, and then an, an, and then an acting out of that. And yes, you recognise those, those, what I've said before, those uh, abuses and misuses. But I think we, we lean to those, oh, well, then there's that and that's why this is. Let's get back to the Bible. Let's be really short. Let's look at the scriptures ourselves and let's not elevate culture over those scriptures. Let's talk about the word of God. Let's see it and say, is this true from the word? Is it true for the church? And begin to then model that. And I tell you, it, it speaks volumes to people when they see your marriage or your relationship or your manhood displayed amongst single women or whatever, it speaks volumes to people. Then they begin to ask you why. In and out, I'm talking about the outside world. Um, I don't know if that answers your, your question. Do you want to follow up with something that's yeah, a I bit guess, more? Um, let, let's, um, three examples, okay. two more serious, one slightly more trivial. Uh, does the Bible have something specific to say about who should be the principal earner of money in a marriage. Right, yep. Who should uh, be looking after children growing up? Yep. And the slightly more frivolous one, who should buy a car? <laughs> Remember, it's not a competency issue. So, so the husband's role as leader, protector, and provider, that, that main provider in the home would be that it doesn't preclude the woman from working. Proverbs 31. The Proverbs 31 woman, she, she's, she's an intelligent woman and she works. But in a complementarian marriage, you, the husband is seen to be that main provider in the home. So I would argue this, okay, so say you've got, your wife can earn a lot more money than you, yeah? I would still say you need to be, if she did work full time and then you, you would have to pay her back, you must be working full time, you must take less money. You adjust your lifestyle according to the precepts of God, not what is comfortable or pragmatic. See, we're tempted to raise pragmatism and what seems to work over precept of divine will. So, not precluding women for working, but m m the husband being that main provider. Now, you might say, well, what if someone is in a car accident and the husband loses his ability to work? 
How does that work? Well, the inclination, the man, the man has lost that a bit. The inclination is that he is to be that physical and spiritual provider in the home. Now, he can still be a, a spiritual provider and there's probably many jo- jobs he could adapt to, even if he was in a wheelchair. But that inclination is there in the heart to have that balance uh, and to have that biblical complementarity. What was the second one? Uh, yeah. So if she could earn, so say, let's say you can rake, rake in 30 grand a year, but if your wife, wife worked full time, she could rake in 50. So you, if you have her working full time, so she's working part time and uh, work out the figures, she's getting 10 grand a year working part time or 15 grand a year. But if she works full time, she gets 50 grand a year and you work part time, your combined income is going to be a lot more. Yeah? I'm saying to you, that the man, according to scripture, to be the main provider in the home, take less money. What if you both work in full time and she's earning a lot more than you? Oh, you're so talking about... Work so right, yeah, yeah. So you're in a position where the children... The, the work, so, so now we get into... I think that might follow your question. You're in a position where I'm assuming that you're both working full time and the children aren't on it's the scene. Like that, yeah, 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 I know. Well, this is where it goes and this is good. Uh, the children aren't on the scene, you're both working full time. Yeah, I mean, that's what she's earning, yeah, main provider. But when, it, when it, it comes to that situation where the home is her primary domain and you've got that, that, the aspect of children then and you've got to have somebody in the home, the wife's primary domain is the home, the husband's primary domain being in the workplace. When Amanda and I were, you know, I mean, obviously I was earning more than her even when we were first married, but so that wasn't, you know, even an, an issue as it were. But the fact is, she's trained for whatever she's trained for, and she's working full time. She'll be bringing in more money. That's not, that's not the, that's not the sense of primary provider. Her primary domain is is the home, and and then when the children come along, to be with the children, to nurture those children, to be that trainer in the household, as it were. And your primary domain is is out there in the in the workplace. Obviously, coming back into the home and teaching in the home and taking that leadership role. So, and 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 that would exactly because well yeah and that's not, no 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that inclination for that man to be the main provider, especially when you get into the situation with children, which is the, this is the, this is the key. So you always want to say that it doesn't preclude women from working because there's biblical precedent for that, I think, in Proverbs 31. Uh, and, you, you know, you want to encourage that, and, you know, even if there's children on the scene. But her, if, that's, if she's working to the neglect of her home and children, then there's an issue there that needs to be... Addressed. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's it's something that I think. Um, could be, a, I haven't developed an actual series on it or, you know, a whole talks on it. So that's to answer your question. There aren't sort of specific talks on that. You're, you're talking about should divorce ever be allowed, divorce and remarriage, those kind of um, things. Well, yeah, I think when you get a bit older, you get into situations with friends, the Christians that Stuff's years. happened, yeah. And then you, you've got to deal with the circumstances of that, whatever the... Yeah. And I think it's a complicated subject. It is, yeah. Yeah, well, you're giving me a good idea. I think I'll insert another module into the. I'll do another one with just on divorce or three, three courses on divorce. Well, it's just how the church deals with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's relevant within marriage. Yeah. Yeah, and then where does your church stand? Where does your church stand with regards to is divorce ever allowable? Is divorce allowable for adultery and for abandonment? And if that's the case, then how do you deal with the divorces? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've, ha- I've, I've had one or two questions on those before, and 
I want to just be a bit careful because if I'm in another person's church as well, I'm not quite maybe sure whether they, what their particular stand and what they've dealt with in terms of pastoral problems in the church with divorce. So, but um, it's a good, it's a good area of study, yeah, for sure, and needed. You, you were going to ask something, follow up, yeah, and the driving, yeah. Um, I guess in terms of the headshot, yeah. Mm. and actually delegating that sort of responsibility to the best of your family. So if my wife is great with finance... Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I see what you're going at, yeah. Use that skill if she's great in terms of yep. her earning potential. Yeah. Is that I'm best that I then delegate that. Yeah. It's to kind of put a slant, slant on that. So, so in terms of like... So, so you, let's say your wife's good at the fi- financial accountancy, yeah, in the home then. So you then look at your wife and say, like, can you take care of the finances for us, yeah? You're actually delegating that as a role of leadership. So you're now trying to draw that parallel then into saying, oh, you've got more earning potential, yeah? But I think that then that comes into the area of real, like, in terms of financial provision for the home. Now, this is like skills within the home and home management, yeah? Financial provision for the, for the home, where I would say that, we had that example, we've had the, the, the other example with if you're, if you're married and I always be saying, well, look at the balance and then, you know, if you're going just for the more money, are you going for a pragmatic approach over biblical pattern? And then I suppose you can see that in the church as well. So if yeah. some people are engaged in teaching certain Yeah, yeah. So therefore, so I guess under meal headship, yeah. is that okay for them to teach? Uh, what are you saying though, where? From the pulpit? Yeah, so, well, yeah, I guess so. You could talk to a few sort of areas there. So, what's the difference between from the pulpit and a seminar? Yeah, the yeah, seminar? yeah. So, we would have a consistent complementarian view of the church. So, we would see this consistent complementarity r- flowing from the Trinity, headship and submission in the most perfect relationship, yeah, into then the church family. So elders, male headship in the church, husbanding, as it were, the congregation into the nuclear family. So the household of God, nuclear household. Okay? So then looking at what headship is, is this leadership with authority. Looking at what Paul says in, in, in 1 Timothy 2, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over men. This is within the church family, the church context and the order of... Of, of teachers, teaching with authority, authoritative teaching over men. So then that would flow from the pulpit. We wouldn't have women teaching in the mixed congregation, as it were, in small groups. It's authoritative teaching of the Bible. Um, and, and this is a good question. I'm not saying it's not a good question, but I think these, this is the way we follow it through. Then you would come to questions of, what about women reading scripture in a worship service? I would argue that that's authoritative teaching. You, you say, well, it's just reading the scripture. I'm just saying, you might say. You might say, it's just reading the scripture. I say, what's the purpose of reading the scripture? To do what? To edify. It's thus saith the Lord. If our, if we, if our minds were totally glorified, all we need is the word of God and we'd accept it for what it is, the very word of God, First Thessalonians. So when, if a woman's upset in the, in the mixed congregation, reading scripture, just reading scripture, I'm not saying even expounding on it, then I would argue that that has authoritative teaching that is a, is a, is a prohibition, as it were, from the scriptures. And so all the time in this, and, and here's where I w- want to be um, gracious as well in terms of, say, other churches might say, well, a woman can, could read scripture in, in, in church. Or you might say, uh, oh, we'll have some women doing some teaching in, in small group ministry. We wouldn't. We'd follow that pattern through. Um, but I want to be saying all the time, what I'm going for is not to prohibit women, but to delineate, put on show 
the glory of manhood and womanhood in the church to display the gospel in such a way that God is most glorified and creates that culture then where women actually flourish to be what they ought to be and men flourish to be what they ought to be. Not what you think you, you ought to be or not because you think you got a right to this or I'm looking for a loophole out of it or as a grating or a chafing on it, you know? And wanting to teach and preach in this kind of stuff in such a way that, yes, this is good. And then when we come to those grey areas, we talk about it and, and we have to work through it. And your church then has to come to their own decision on wisdom issues. Another one would be, what about a woman teaching young people or youth? When does a youth become a man? And suddenly you're having exercise and authority over a, over a man. So they become wisdom issues to, to deal with in the church. But we for Calvary Grace... We, will, we would hold a very, what we call a consistent complementarianism to try and follow that pattern through. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, we're saying she's precluded the, it's the, the authoritative teaching role, as it were, and, the, and those things thereof. Um, there's hundreds of ministries. And, and, and here's the thing. In that brown book I'm talking about, Piper and Grudem, which you can get online free, by the way, they have a whole chapter where there is just countless listings of women's ministries and which, you know, mission stuff and all of these things that women uh, are released into in, in uh, ministry. So there's countless. So rather than just saying, oh, a woman can't do that, I want to say women can do this. And so then, as men in the church, to be kind of a little bit like you alluded to as well in the home, is, is helping your wife to flourish, but where? In a Godward direction, as God sets out pattern for womanhood. Not just according to her own desires, but according to what God sets out for womanhood. So there's just countless, countless uh, ministries available to women. Um, but there's this one area of male leadership, teaching with authority within the church, headship in the home. And so, I know I'm going on a bit here, but it's a good, it's a good discussion. Um, very quickly, uh, I'll probably cl close on this. So I was just having a discussion with one of the guys there. He says, some egalitarians will say, I'll agree with that in the headship in the home, but not in the church. So how do I deal with that? This person, I think, would, would say you do agree with headship in the church. And so, well, the way that you can deal with it is you return to this truth. Colossians 1, Christ is the head of the church. Leadership with authority. Matthew 16, I will build my church. Who's building the church? Who's in charge around here? Christ is in charge. And he structures his church the way he wants it. What is the church? The household of God. Look at those texts in the pastoral epistles that speak of the church as the household of God. And thereby you, you draw then, so in the nuclear household, you, as you have headship and submission, so in the household of God, you have this headship and submission pattern. And who's in charge of the church, head of the church? Christ is. And who structures his church? Christ. And so Christ gives pastor teachers to the church as gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Um, so that's just a good way, I think, of picturing that, that whole and like dealing with the consistent complementarianism that's in view, I believe, in, in the scriptures.